Hey Dylan, thanks for taking my call. Hey Dylan, big fan of the show. Huge fan of the show, love what you're doing. Big fan of the show, I'm so glad to have a minute of your time. Hi Dylan, it's Dylan. Dude, Dylan. Look, I cannot help you, I'm sorry. It's not hard to understand, okay? So, here's my thought. You would be crazy to think that. Well, welcome into the Dylan Berry Network. I am your host, Dylan Berry. It is a very special edition of Hey Dylan today. Uh, it's going to look a little different, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a lot of fun. But i got a lot of stuff on my mind, all right? A lot of stuff has been going on. But what seems to be the theme in my mind lately, uh, the past few days, is uh, one of the greatest superheroes ever written, ever talked about. Uh, and that is Batman. And there's plenty of Batman news as well as uh, maybe maybe one of the best storytellers of Batman. Christopher Nolan uh, has a big, big movie coming out that could save all movies. And uh, I brought in a special guest to talk to me about all things Batman and about Christopher Nolan. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for my good friend, Zach Dunn. Zach, welcome to the DBN. Zach, how you feeling? Hey, Dylan, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for bringing me back. Dude, I'm, I'm just thrilled. I mean, yeah, dude, uh, glad to have you on. There is, uh, there's a lot of stuff. Okay, so one one of the big things that hit us this weekend, DC had its big like conference, right? Its big fandom thing happening. A lot of a few trailers dropped. Uh, now, there, we'll, we'll a break. few is a, might might be an understatement. A few, but uh, but a few huge ones, which really made it feel like 2021 could be the year of Batman. Let's start with the movie, okay? Uh, you saw this trailer Sunday afternoon. I got a text from you that just said, dude, the Batman trailer. Mm -hmm. Uh, what were your first thoughts when you saw this yes. thing? Well, it's so funny because we're, we're driving down from Heber and it's about a two hour drive and we spent a good chunk of time talking about how, how excited we were for this movie, or at least I monologued for a while about how excited I was for this movie. Um, and then to get home and to see the Batman trailer is out, I clicked on it and I was pretty blown away. To be honest with you, I I'm unbelievably excited for this movie now. Yeah, yeah, there's there's no doubt about it. It, it it's funny the trailer it like because because the last ten years of Batman since we've said goodbye to Christopher Nolan's trilogy, um, Batman has been cinematically tough, right? We've had Batman v Superman. Water. Yeah, yeah, we, we've had Batman v Superman. Um, that was, you know, tough, you know, Batman was in Suicide Squad, which we don't talk about, right? Like that's, yeah. you know, we avoid it, but, uh, and then even this movie has been announced for a while, um, like, like that this was happening. Robert Pattinson was named Batman mm -hmm. and, you know, we didn't know what that was going to end up looking like How, initially, like this feels dark, this feels heavy, but in a maybe more smooth, more grounded in reality way than, the Superman. Is that a direction you want to see? It yeah, going? that's a really good way to put it. A hundred percent. Um, and I think, you know, it's too bad for Ben Affleck. I think he would have had a really good potential to play an older Batman and he never really got the chance to do that. But well, that's in the rearview mirror. We're past it. Um, so I, I distinctly remember seeing the casting announcement that Robert Pattinson was going to be the next Batman. And yeah. I think like everybody, I was like, what skinny, pretty boy Pattinson is going to be the dark Knight," the And I kind of sat on it for, yeah for like 15 minutes and i was like you know what this might actually be the best possible choice you could have gone with yeah. um because anybody who's seen any of his recent roles between good time and the lighthouse like yeah. the guy can do it absolutely yeah. um so yeah to the to your point of the tone i mean they went with this really noir gritty grounded um just kind of filthy gotham look to it which i'm so yeah. excited by i mean i think i think nolan you know really revolutionized what a, a grounded superhero movie could look like but this movie to me looks like the director Matt Reeves asked the question, if Batman and his rogues gallery actually existed, what might they look like? Yeah. Um, and that seems to me to be the angle that they're taking. And I'm, I, I couldn't be more thrilled. Tell Man, me what, what were your first impressions dude, of when you saw the trailer? One thing that I'm a huge fan of, and, and when it comes to the nineties, Batman's my favorite is Batman forever. And it could be because that's the one that we watched so much at our house growing up. Uh, it was Batman for Val Kilmer was my Batman like I'm totally in on it uh, but Jim Carrey as the Riddler to me was just so iconic he was perfect <laughs> for it and right. to me to see this new crazy twist on Riddler uh, is some as from Paul right. Dano from Paul Dano who is uh, maybe one of the more underrated actors living and breathing today Absolutely. Um, who's done great yeah. work Swiss Army Man Prisoners um, there will be blood like, like like Paul Dano can bring some intensity 
uh, to a role that usually is a little silly, but we have a dark exactly. take on, on Riddler. And Riddler was my favorite part of the Arkham games, which we'll talk about in a second. But mm-hmm. uh, to me, Riddler t- is just so exciting. Zoe Kravitz looks so great as, as Catwoman. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're seeing somebody different there than we've seen before. And, uh, yeah, I don't, it's just it, like – I think I think Pattinson has proven that he can show what damaged looks like, and there's no more damaged person maybe than Bruce Wayne, right? And so, which uh, how, when was the last time we saw that? I mean, you know, we hear about you know how Bruce Wayne is so driven by this rage inside him, and that you know the death of his parents you know weighs on him, and he feels responsible, which you know he absolutely shouldn't. But I can't think of another Batman that's really dug into that. You get a couple scenes in Batman Begins. Um, where you see him being kind of pouty, but this looks like a man who's just completely driven mad by his own grief and his own rage, and he's going to take it out on the scum of Gotham. And I yeah. personally can't wait. Yeah, dude. And one one role Pattinson had was through. Did you see Good Time? Have you seen Good Time? I did. I love Good Time. Good Time. That was for me showed that he can kind of carry that uh, psychological. Like there's something clearly going off in his head. Like that was an intensity that I saw from Pattinson. That if you're someone who you're not sold on Pattinson yet, I'd say watch Good Time, maybe watch The Lighthouse if you're feeling crazy, you know, uh, maybe <laughs> maybe Great add quarantine some, movie, yeah, yeah, maybe add something uh, to your diet to make yourself enjoy that movie a little more. Whatever you got to do, <laughs> The Lighthouse. I mean, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think a, a good damaged Bruce Wayne because yeah, we haven't had a a real like Batman Batman movie. Um, since yeah, Batman Begins because The Dark Knight was so overshadowed, mm-hmm. uh, rightfully so, by a, a great performance and a great villain. And e- even in The Dark Knight Rises, it felt more like um, uh, just an ensemble cast story. Yep, and so 100%. here, here I think we'll see how it's balanced because that's a hard thing to do. I think superhero movies where it's not team up movies and you're dealing with a lot of villains, it's hard to juggle all that. You see Spider Man three kind of <laughs> fail 3. at that. <laughs> that's a great example of a like, failing at that. Um, but they have dude, the 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 table is set. I will say for I this know. movie, and I'm I'm sold. I've watched it three or four times now. To Same. where I I'm locked in, man. Matt Reeves and we talked about this. Um, but uh, he directed these Planet of the Apes movies, um, this this great trilogy that came out in the last 15 or so years. Um, another one, yeah, go and check those out if you really want to trust this director um, who's clearly got a good vision when it comes to kind of jumping into a world that's already been created. Uh, and mm-hmm. I, I think we're going to see that that happen pretty well. Um, so the two things that I want to mention there, A, it just popped in my head. You talked about Paul Dano, and I got some serious kind of seven slash Zodiac vibes from it, mm-hmm. which to your point, you know, Riddler's always this kind of goofy, ha ha ha, Jim Carrey kind of character. Yeah. But to see him as an intense serial killer is utterly terrifying, Yeah. Um, which to put him up against Batman. Um, and, you know, traditionally, the Riddler's kind of stick is that he figures out that Bruce Wayne and Batman are one and the same. Yeah. Uh, so whether they go that route in this one, not sure. But I'll tell you what sold me on the premise of the Batman, you know, when they're making the casting announcements. Because, you know, I was on board with Pattinson. I was curious what that was going to look like. When they announced Jeffrey Wright as Commissioner Gordon, mm, I was dude. sold. Yeah. Uh, and seeing him even for a couple seconds in this, I cannot wait. He's one of my favorite underrated actors yeah so for him to kind of step into that role of jim gordon i think he's gonna absolutely kill it and i'm i'm so excited to see it yeah man it will be uh it, it's just it's just something to be look forward to for 2021 well, let's think about this dylan they're only 25 percent of the way through filming that trailer's cut yeah. from 25 percent of the footage <laughs> yeah yeah and and who knows i think i think warner brothers i th- i feel like is the one who has been at fault with a lot of these snyder cut stuff and um you know, like they want to get involved. They want to plop in all these things. Hopefully that there is enough um, creativity given to the directors and the writers uh, of this, that they're able to film exactly what they want and put in exactly what they mm. want because the fans are hungry for a great Batman story because truly the, the, the best Batman story we've had in the last 10 years has to be the Lego Batman movie. And I mean that sincerely. That is, a I truly... hear that. I've not seen that yet. So Dude, that's that probably is... strike against me as a Batman fan. Me and Michael DeConte on his biopic, we did our favorite DC movies. And I think that that was definitely in my top five DC in general. Um, and so that's one that I'm like, dude, I'm sold. And, and then of course the Arkham games is another great storytelling for Batman that I am 
big fan of, huge fan. And mm-hmm. to see another Batman game come from Warner Brothers Toronto or Vancouver Montreal. or whatever. Montreal. One, one of those Canadian those. cities. I don't know. <laughs> they all run together. I'm American. I don't those, have to know. Those Warner Brother Canadians know what they're doing. Uh, so this trailer uh, for, for Gotham Knights. Um, mm-hmm. the, the creator is saying that this is actually in a different universe than the Arkham. Um, this is this is completely different. Oh, I didn't catch that. Well, and for me, when I saw first Bruce Wayne's face, you know, right at the beginning, because you see this video of Bruce Wayne, mm-hmm. beginning of the trailer, be- great, haunting. Like that is that is something to get your blood pumping. Uh, I was like, that kind of looks different because I'm just replaying the Arkham games now. Uh, we talked about that, but. Uh, yeah, this is going to be set in a totally different world, but you're going to only be able to play with uh, these four of like Batman's team of this squad. You got uh, Nightwing, you got Robin, you got Batgirl, and you got – help me out here – the fourth person, which I couldn't really figure uh, out. Red, the Hood. Guns. Red Hood. Red Hood. And, Red Hood. Yeah, Jason yeah. Todd. And, and apparently this is supposed to be a big-scaled multiplayer-type map. It's going to – it looks as though similar combat, but – um, the gameplay is going to be seemingly groundbreaking um, in, in what I've seen. What did you think of the trailer? What did you make of where they're going with this? Yeah. So, I mean, right out of the gate, um, like I said, that, that opening monologue from Bruce where he's basically saying goodbye to the Bat family was really, really moving, surprisingly, um, especially from a usually kind of cold and emotionless guy like Bruce Wayne. Yeah. Um, and so my initial reaction was, was pretty lukewarm. Honestly, I was like, ah, do we need another Arkham game? You know, so WB uh, Montreal did Arkham Origins, but Rocksteady did, you know, the main three of the trilogy. So I was yeah. a little bit hesitant about that. Yeah. Uh, but as you watch this kind of progress um, and you get a feel for that, it's actually a co-op game. Yeah. That's really what sold me. Because in my mind, I was like, you know, the Arkham games are great. I don't think we need another one. I think the formula has been pretty much perfected and played out. What else can you do? And yeah. then I thought, well, if I get to play with Dylan and we yeah. get to go save Gotham together, yeah, I that and we will and we will. Me. Oh, we we're will. going to. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was still a little bit. I watched some of the gameplay um, and wasn't really sold. I mean, it's obviously pre-alpha footage, so it's really early on in development. Yeah. But really, what actually got my interest is the post-credit scene on the post-credit scene. We say <laughs> even yeah. on trailers, uh, but in the opening trailer, um, they make it pretty clear that the Court of Owls is going to be the main sort of antagonist which, here which which yeah do you have any insight on that because as someone who you know i thought i was a big batman fan the the mm. court of owls was something i had to do a little bit of research on uh where do you like is this a good direction to go do you think that, that is an extra well i'm a little bit disappointed that it's not batman going up against them but i think this is a really it's probably the best time to do it because you know they're basically the illuminati of gotham city um and one of their main goals is to basically destroy the batman and it seems from the trailer that they've succeeded and it's now up to the Bat family to avenge Batman, which is a really cool setup for, uh, for I think, kind of a revenge story, which plays into, you know, the Batman mythos a lot. I mean, Batman's whole shtick is vengeance. Yeah. Vengeance. Um, which, a, a great, a great <laughs> closing line, a, a great, a great closing line to that trailer, by the way, with, mm-hmm. uh, with Pat's coming uh, right That was hard. I mean, the first time you hear the Batman voice, you are, you know, this is not a Marvel movie. <laughs> when he just <laughs> absolutely pummels that poor man. Uh, um, but yeah, Court of Owls is a really fascinating... Um, I think it's a relatively new addition to the Batman canon. I want to say within the last 15 years or so. I think I remember being a kid and walking around to Barnes & Noble and seeing the graphic novels first coming out for that. Um, but they're they're scary. I mean, Batman really thinks that Gotham is his city, but when he gets wrapped up in the Court of Owls, he realizes that he's not in control of Gotham and that they're really the ones pulling the strings. Um and they introduced yeah. Talon in that trailer, which uh, is a really formidable foe. So I, th- I think the game's got some potential. I'm not 100% sold yet, but That's there old. could be something there. I think the co-op is um, – I'm really impressed by that move. I, I can tell – you feel like they're taking a little bit of a gamble there, and I th- hopefully it pays off because I think that would be a really fun experience to do with your friends to be able to go save Gotham together. Now, I didn't prep you for this, but like you, you said like you don't really need another Arkham game. Because our Arkham Knight, uh, you played Arkham Knight, right? Uh, I did. Our Arkham Knight ends with uh, an explosion of Wayne Manor, and it it's kind of it's the end, right? He is he is passing it on, and uh, you kind of get a little figure in the night comes to save somebody. You assume maybe it's 
the you know how that game wraps up we'll say um mm-hmm. uh like like if we did get another batman game would you just i don't know man because the arkham trilogy which people leave out origins <laughs> which isn't a bad isn't a bad Fair move enough. isn't a bad move no. um if you Good got game, another batman game, but game it's not part of the trilogy if you got another batman game like what would you want it to look like or, or do you think we're set because it's got to come up eventually it does um and really i think rocksteady knocked it so far out of the park that you almost have to go in a completely different direction yeah. with it um origins was really fun i mean maybe maybe you could do explore something with like batman year one where he's new to gotham he's getting introduced to the villains um he's building his suit you know i'm thinking very batman begins you know you maybe just start out with just the simple the the cat suit kind of thing and you're meeting gordon but i think it's going to be really really hard to improve and iterate off of what rocks that he did that trilogy um because i mean we see they completely changed how hand-to-hand combat works in almost every game you play i mean they invented that hit counter stun system that yeah. is just so well, addicting i think for me what it was is when i was playing spider-man uh 2018 um we talked about that quite a bit too um but playing that one that gameplay is just it feels like i'm playing a new version of the arkham games but in new york city and with mm-hmm. spider-man and it was marvel and it, it in a lot of ways is very similar and it made me go man i wish this gameplay like I was feeling this, but in Ar- in Arkham or in Gotham or, or you know, I yeah. was I was I was playing as a Batman. Uh, so one one of the things, one of the last things I, I, I sent you, uh, well, also Batman related. This is before we got the trailer. This is yes. before we, we got this was the, the game trailer. the impetus of this conversation. Yes. Uh, we were supposed to have this a week ago. And you know what? Good thing we didn't because we had all this mm-hmm. other good stuff mm-hmm. to talk about. <laughs> you know? um, but I had, a, I had a buddy send me um, this kind of. Um, quote from a Peter Rollins book um, called Insurrection, where he he basically uh, debates kind of the morality of Batman. And it was a really interesting thing. And what's funny is, is I don't usually get into politics like a ton. Um, and this was one when this is kind of what art is all about, where you, you put in your, your favorite thing, you know, whether it is an athlete, whether it's a, a comic book, person whether it's a J.R.R. Tolkien character and you you kind of are questioning morality and you question choices and that's what makes these characters so great basically this guy presents who is more important for Gotham Thomas Wayne or Bruce Wayne and uh basically coming after Bruce Wayne saying Bruce Wayne maybe didn't use his funds to, to what the city actually needed now the quote goes into you know what if Bruce Wayne instead of using all of his money on gadgets and on big ships and big cars and you know all these things R and D departments <laughs> shout out Morgan Freeman <laughs> um, and he instead puts it into social systems that uh, obviously this is all hypothetical we are talking about a fictional character in a fictional world but but that's what makes it so fun that that is the point I I think that is mm-hmm. the point. And uh, talks about this idea of, you know, what if instead of putting that money, he puts it into social systems to where the Joker can't hire henchmen because those henchmen don't need money and don't need an easy out. But they have a way to supply for their families that is good for society and whatnot. What was your thoughts immediately on this? Because for me, I got really defensive, but it also caused me to question a little bit and go, Mm -hmm. huh, interesting. I've got a lot of thoughts on this um because the the fundamental question here is could bruce wayne do more for gotham as a philanthropist than he could as batman yeah um and that's a great point that that thomas wayne is a really good embodiment of that um so and this is something we saw thomas wayne try you know and and i think i'm gonna i'm gonna really stick to a lot of um nolan's dark knight trilogy on this just because i think it's the most common language for batman that we have Um, and actually i actually think the 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 author of this was referring to batman begins mostly yeah Mm -hmm. so that works so that's what you you sent me this that's immediately what i went and watched because that's i think the most um gotham centric of them um gotham plays the biggest character just as a city yeah so you know the big thing that we see there is that Thomas Wayne, you know, the most tangible example of this is that he creates this um, new free public transportation system mm-hmm. as for some, that, that guy's Australian accent that slips in there always bugs me. Um, <laughs> but the, it makes a really good point that, you know, we see in a lot of developed countries that spend um, that put, put a lot of money into their welfare systems that they do typically have lower crime rates, higher education, which, which all plays into that and tr- 
transportation is a huge part of that, that if you can give people the ability to work throughout a city, um, that they don't necessarily need to deal with the high cost of living there, that something like a free public transit system that Thomas Wayne built in Gotham should have a serious impact on unemployment, therefore crime, we would yeah. say, right? Later in that movie, though, um, I'm trying to remember exactly what character it is, but really uh, somebody mentions that, listen, Thomas nearly bankrupted Wayne Industries yeah. fighting this depression, which then you later see when Bruce returns from Princeton to go to his parents' uh, hearing or to see Joe Chill's release, Rachel uh, takes him down uh, to the slums and says, don't. Another, well, that's another episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I'm coming back to her. Um, but she, she takes uh, Bruce down there. She says, listen, the depression, you know, may have, you know, drifted away, but not down here. Things are still really bad down here. Yeah. So despite everything, they were able to clean up things on a surface level but not completely thoroughly yeah um which really you know and actually let me let me pose a question here dylan um because the day you sent me this conundrum um i've been listening to the tipping point by malcolm gladwell because you oh know, my I'm gosh a, I'm a classic I, man who i yeah, bought I that book i bought that book uh, in the last month as well did you really yeah, i absolutely did <laughs> okay, yeah so have you gotten to the part where he talks about new york city crime uh yes, uh how the 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 fashion and the shoes and the oh okay so that's early he comes back to New York later yeah. um to talk about how there was this big um you know I forget the decades forgive me but there was a massive crime wave for ten years and then over the next ten years it essentially disappeared really people who had been committing crimes essentially stopped and this is such a, a Gladwell question to explore um he poses this theory of what um I think what's called the broken windows theory um forget where that name came from but essentially the example that he uses is that in order to stop violent crime on the subway and this all stems from a very joker-esque real life story of a man on the new york city subway who was accosted by you know three young black men pulls out his own gun and shoots them and then runs away yeah. and he's hailed as a hero across the city as this man who stands up as a vigilante to subway crime uh, but really it's indicative of this much larger issue and you know he was a pretty regular guy um, until you you kind of dig into his background and you realize that essentially there are all these symbols in the environment of the subway and the subway station, the graffiti, the broken turnstiles, the panhandlers, all of this sends this signal to everybody there that because petty crime like that is accepted, more and more crime can be acceptable. Hmm. Right? Yeah. So really it's the idea of, of context in your environment um, being able to impact people's behavior, which when you apply that to Gotham City can create some really interesting questions. Yeah. So when you think about what does a person or a symbol like Batman, a vigilante who beats criminals to a pulp with his bare hands, what kind of message do you think that sends to the citizens of Gotham? Hmm. A lot of copycats. A lot of copycats, Alfred. <laughs> But, I mean, to a point that does, because those people yeah. see Gotham, um, you know, Brian, for example, in The Dark Knight, um, says, you know, he's a symbol that we don't have to be afraid of scum like you. Yeah. I would like to counter that and saying that criminals like the Riddler, like Joker, see Gotham willing to accept a character clearly yeah. as unstable as Batman, and they also see that as a place that they can thrive. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a dichotomy to that. I think um, – I believe it's at the end of Batman Begins and they're on the roof. Um, and uh, they talk about, you know, we start wearing bulletproof vests. They start bringing, you know, the big guns. Escalation. We start, we start wearing masks. They start, you know, doing this and that. And then – is that the right conversation that I'm referring to? I think so. Uh, yeah. It, yeah, it happens yep. somewhere and, of course, he pulls out the Joker card and – uh, he's like, now someone is also, you know, a character just like you, because mm -hmm. if you can accept on one side, like it, it is this interesting escalation to where, yeah, Batman has created this point where, yeah, a young orphan boys, orphans, which yes, the Wayne foundation gives to this orphanage, but orphans are looking up saying, I want to be that guy. I want to fight crime. And then he goes up and then he creates his own set of villains. And it, it is this like. But then if you do that in, in social systems, won't the same thing happen where um, you know you bring in good 
well, a different type of evil is going to meet you right at that same level. And, and is that is, is that what it's like in life? Is that always going to be, no matter what br- amount of good you bring up, an evil is going to follow at the same mm. level? You know, and to jump universes a little bit, um, this is something kind of goofy that I always thought um, in Captain America Civil War that Vision says, where he's like, oh, in the X number of years since Mr. Stark revealed himself as Iron Man, you know, the number of world-ending events has yeah. risen commensurately which i was like okay that's kind of a, a cute way to say hey you know like we get it iron man was the first one and then all this stuff started happening but i think it calls into question the same problem that does the presence of superheroes invite the presence of supervillains but you, you made a really interesting point there dylan that i want to come back to where you say that you know if we if we pump all this into social systems would that be enough and batman begins the answer is no because yeah. the primary problem there is the corruption within the Gotham police, within the justice system. And it's something that Rachel kind of propagates. You know, she says, you know, we have to trust the system, Bruce. And he says, no, the system's broken because you have people like Judge Faden. You have them letting Joe Chill, the man who murdered Thomas and Martha Wayne out of prison just because he has information on Carmine Falcone. The corruption is blatant. And I don't think there's any amount of money that Bruce Wayne, the philanthropist, could pump in to the system that would get rid of that. I think the more money you put in the system, I think that pulls the bottom feeders out of the woodwork. They see an opportunity there. Mm-hmm. So could do you think Gotham could survive without Batman? Well, and, and that's what the beauty of the Dark Knight is, right? Is then you bring in this white knight, a politician comes in, and, and he comes in and gets to save the day. But, I mean, the system is so broken and ruined that even a white knight like Harvey Dent can be compromised. Like... Like, no one is above being compromised, and I think that is the great thing there, even with Two-Face as a character, because he he is this, you know, great man who locks away a, a record number of gang members, and they take them all off the street, but that doesn't always equate to taking it all out. You know, there are still right. problems here, and then someone is always going to bounce and reach Batman. And honestly, you could you could argue that if... Harvey cleared all those out and Batman never existed. Joker probably would have never came up, you know, because if it's that same idea of matching good and evil, then maybe mm-hmm. Joker wouldn't have showed up. Uh, thank so goodness I, I he did, though. <laughs> oh, thank God he did. Um, I, th- I think there's two things to touch on there. A, that before Harvey became Two Faced, when he was attempting to lock up all these criminals, he needed to get Lau to basically rico all those criminals together and he wasn't going to be able to get lao without batman because yeah. batman yeah. has no jurisdiction yeah that's true um but and, and you know you talked about this earlier that you know would these super villains even if they came into fruition even if batman as a symbol allowed these people to come to life would they have any any henchmen anybody to do their dirty work right um, and that's and what... i i think i i kind of disagree with that assessment actually i think that um, specifically someone like the Joker, um, you know, you look at the scene where Harvey is willing to uh, shoot the guy um, in the back alley to find out, um, you know, more about the Joker, the guy who's got the Rachel yeah. Dawes tag on him. Um, and Batman comes in and he says, you know, he's a paranoid schizophrenic from Arkham, you know, the kind yeah. of mind the Joker attracts. Yeah. Is any amount of welfare going to gonna <laughs> stop? I I guess the question is, 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 are some people, no matter what you do, fundamentally disposed to crime? Yeah. Um, and... And that's, that's a pretty a deep moral yeah. question, and, and I don't I don't know the answer to it. Yeah, because the the author of this thing argues that like if there were social systems in place, uh, yeah, Joker would have no place to get henchmen. He would he would have no because because these people are have no other place to turn to than to crime. Um, and, and yeah, like you're saying uh, with the Joker, the Joker he feeds off the people that like literally almost have. No, nothing like, like can only be squeezed out of. Um, and then, yeah, you kind of run into that. It's like, well, well, what can save those people other than, you know, now I'm pretty confident the Joker could do all this with a couple sticks of dynamite and a few drums of gasoline. (laughs) You know, I don't, I don't know if the Joker, you know, he, he definitely needs a person here or there, but, um, I think somebody motivated enough would be able to do it. You know, let's look at, bringing back to Batman Begins, let's look at Ra's al Ghul. Yeah. You know, if somebody like Ra's al Ghul wants to destroy Gotham, mm-hmm. I don't care how many foundations or philanthropies yeah. that Wayne establishes. 
and and the and if now if was that when I was rewatching Batman Begins. Go ahead. Oh, well, I mean, if you're going the route of Ra's al Ghul too, that that is another one who's got a really twisted way of seeing justice because really Ra's al Ghul wants justice. He wants only good things, but the only way he sees it going through is to wipe everybody out. And that's what makes him evil because it is just this twisted way of thinking like the only way to solve everything is just to squash it, start over, which, hey, you know, Maybe that has worked. <laughs> I mean, I I don't really know when or how or in, in reality, but you know, he talks he about burning things. Rome and and yeah, bringing the plague rats to London. Um, yeah. all terribly horrific events. And I'm not enough of a historian to look at the back end of those tragedies and see if there was a benefit to society. Um, I don't know, but I think that comparison between Roz and Rachel is really interesting in that movie because. Roz, obviously an antagonist, Rachel, um, you know, what we would call a good guy. And that, um, like I said earlier, I think Rachel's both have a flawed worldview, and but Rachel's trust in the justice system, which is corrupt, um, is clearly a big reason for why things the way that they are. And when Roz al Ghul comes, he has a solution. It's a horrible solution, but maybe if he had been allowed to do what he wanted, he would have cleared out a lot of that corruption, you know, maybe in the ugliest way possible, but cleared it nonetheless. Yeah. It, it, it's fascinating uh, to really dive into this. And it really kind of shows you that like how fleshed out a lot of these characters in this world is and how it, it can mirror our own society. Because right now there are people, I think it was uh, uh, Jeff Bezos was just named, uh, was it $200 billion? Uh, billion. Uh, Worst person ever. 200 billion. Like, like that's a big deal. And, Man, I'm the last person to suspect that he is Batman. Um, but but uh, but a guy like that for me, when I heard, first heard this argument, is I is I thought, well, you know, Bruce Wayne, with Wayne Enterprises and with the Wayne Foundation and all these other things that we don't see in the movies, but you see him in in the in the games and the comic books. He's provided definitely a lot of opportunities for jobs, right? Entry level. Um, like be, you need to be a smart person to work at Wayne Enterprises, and you need to like. It's going to offer you a future because it is one of these big companies. But then, yeah, you run into the these, these lower parts of the city that are just really, really tough to, to dig out the, the crime and the poverty and the sickness that is infested in these places. And um, yeah, it's something that a, like a superhero can't do. But uh, the little line that you see in Batman Begins about the coat, I think the coat is a really good uh, symbol whenever he, he swaps it yeah putting a coat on a on a on a young boy but also swapping it with the homeless man i'm just like yo here mm-hmm. you go i'm literally gonna put a coat on your back and then jim gordon you see it put it on his and it's great to see Point. that that scene come at in the third one when mm-hmm. that is how batman reveals who he is to jim gordon um that sometimes all it takes is for you to just put your coat on the back of somebody give them that hope give them that thing and that can that can do big things. I'm a big believer in that. I'm a big believer in doing small things and that they make a big difference. Not just these uh, mm-hmm. taken down sky and beams and whatnot. There's, there's so many moments in that series where you, where you see this, you know, come through. You know, there's the moment at the beginning of the Dark Knight where you know you see the two guys on the street about to do the drug deal. They look up and see the bat symbol. Ah, oh, no, nah, man, not tonight. You know, like that's a way that Batman is inspiring you know not necessarily hope but fear and enough yeah. to stop crime and you know what you make a really good point about the dark knight and i mean about the dark knight rises and its callbacks to batman begins because this is really a question that is posed in batman begins and then alfred says something to the dark knight when bruce is getting ready to go back out there he's like gotham doesn't need your body it needs your resources it needs your information mm. give this to the police you know the police could use this more than you know gotham can use you know batman's brute force and it's part Bruce's paranoia that, you know, if I give all this to Gotham PD, it's going to be corrupted and it's going to be used against the people. And that's why Batman as a symbol is incorruptible. And that's why he feels he's the only one capable of using this in the correct and moral, the morally correct way. Which is the beauty then of the Dark Knight where the Joker twists it. And he makes it to where Batman is the bad guy. Take off your mask or people will die. 
you know, like break your one rule, like, like you, like, it, which makes Batman fall apart. Cause he's like, wait, I'm, this is, this is the symbol, you know, this is why mm-hmm. people have their group therapy sessions in broad daylight. Like, <laughs> like, like it's cause this, and, and the Joker just goes, I just want to mess with this. I just want to, I want to, I want to get my hands in there. I want to make this all messy to where you got no choice. You, you he's not being break. a hero. He's yeah. being something more. Yeah. And, and then in the end, he has to take a step back and, and that leads to other things. And, um, mm-hmm. and then even there, like uh, dark Knight rises and evil will rise and a good has to has to come and meet it. So it's a really interesting, um, really interesting idea. And I think there's a lot to it because. Yeah, I think my my final answer on this is that um, Gotham needs they need them both. Mm-hmm. And, you know, actually, there's something um, really, really funny. I've, I've been trying to find this uh, this Hans Zimmer interview where he talks about the way that him and Nolan came up with the specific Batman theme for this film. Um, and Hans is on the keyboard and he's kind of, he's playing the original Danny Elfman, uh, hmm. theme from the Michael Keaton Batman. Yeah. And it's, you know, a pretty traditional kind of heroic swelling score. And the way he ends up saying how they came to the, the iconic sort of dark Knight Batman theme where it's, mm-hmm. bum, bum, bum. um, you know, he really wanted just those two notes because Batman is this character, this man who's stuck. You yeah. know, he can never really progress past this this trauma that he um, he experienced as a child. So really, you know, rather than him having his own arc, he really tries to give the city that he's in a place to go and ha- tries to help them grow, even if he himself can't. And I just think that's one of the most beautiful things about Batman as a character in a in a world that has almost no beauty at all. Um, but his, I mean, it, it is selfless at the end of the day. Yeah, I think there's a bit of selfishness there, but. Yeah, I, I think ultimately uh, it just comes down to in life, like we're we're going to hit circumstance to make it really personal, like you're going to hit circumstances to where you have to match it with like the right amount of things. And I think Batman was caused to match whatever evil came forward. And it started with Ra's al Ghul and that led in the Joker and then that led in, you know, Bane and then you know, Catwoman was able to come in and, and do her thing because it's just like, OK, this city is about crime and it's about the guy with the mask who fights it. And he goes, all right, well, then I'm going to do that. And you know what? I got to bring in this this orphan boy. And you know what? I got to bring in Commissioner Gordon's daughter. And, you know, I, I got I got to bring in these things and this, this family is going to get bigger and my gadgets got to get bigger. And I got to I got to start flying around in the bat wing and. Uh, like you're always gonna have to match that, and while also Escalation. doing that, there has to be um, other things being put in place to hopefully attack it. There's never just one solution um, with with any of these issues that we're dealing with in real life too. But I do now now that I think about it, now that we talk about it, something I think needs to be investigated is did Ra's al Ghul start the coronavirus? Because I, I wonder now. If, if, hey, that's a possibility, uh, you know, uh oh, no. League of Shadows might be trying to break us down right now. <laughs> I, I, and they're, it's working. It is absolutely it's, working. It's seriously work. We are extremely lacking in a Batman that we could really use right now. The world needs a Dark Knight that we don't have. Yeah. And it shows. We need a White Knight, and man, I don't know that we're getting one anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We need one. Uh, you know, it could be Dr. Fauci. Who knows? But, uh, I don't know. I think, well, you know, I think the moral of the Dark Knight is it takes cooperation. It takes that triumvirate of Commissioner Gordon, Harvey yep. Dent, and the Batman to really get Working anything together. done in this horrible city. And, you know, if we're not able to cooperate and, and pool our strength and pool our resources, then we're just going to end up tearing ourselves apart. I like that. I like that. The government, law enforcement, and private business coming together saying, what do the people need? And all putting their stuff together. Hey, maybe that's the answer. Um, well, speaking of, we've talked a lot about Christopher Nolan and, uh, dude, Tenet's coming out. Tenet is coming out. D- depending on where you are, I, I had a friend here in LA who drove to, to Vegas to see Tenet. And guess what? That is not a crazy thing to do. Not at all. Nope. I'd That's do it. Not a crazy thing to do. Vegas is only four hours from, from me, maybe a little less. Um, Tenet's coming out, man. I don't remember being as excited for a movie. Now, it, it's probably because of lockdown. It's probably because of lack of seeing movies. But it's also because one of my favorite directors in the world Absolutely. is Christopher Nolan. 
Um, tell me about your excitement for this movie. I am an unbelievably big Christopher Nolan fanboy. Yeah. I went out um, to dinner with my family on Monday night, and my poor family, anything we talked about for some reason, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, t- definitely. Remember that part in the Christopher Nolan movie where this, yeah. this, and that? And like, oh, my God, Zach, enough. <laughs> like, yeah. um, but there there was announced that uh, we're in Arizona, we're opening our theaters, you know, very selectively next uh, this week, and then it should be out here uh, next Thursday or Friday. So. You bastard. It's on the horizon, and I can't say you how unbelievably thrilled I am to finally have another Christopher Nolan movie coming to yeah. us. And you know, uh, the the last one that came out um, was just two years ago, right? Uh, Dunkirk, or was it 2017? Um, was was Dunkirk, and you know, but but we haven't seen big scale like this type of of Christopher Nolan's probably since Interstellar. This is gonna be more Interstellar uh, okay. type Nolan. But um, I wanted to talk about top three Nolan films because. There's a little prep work. I mean, I know I want to watch a movie, some Nolan movies before I jump into it. And I have in the last few months just because I'm a big fan anyway. I wasn't even thinking about Tenet coming up. Um, but what I want to do is I want to do like top three Nolan movies. Are you, you feel prepared for that? have you frozen yeah Zach maybe leave and then come back Oh, there he is. My apologies, Dylan. How unprofessional. No, dude, it's fine. We're, we're chilling. We're chilling. This is going to be great. All right. So what I want to do, Zach, Zachary Dunn. Uh, here, talk for me real quick, Zach. Zach, talk real quick. Can you hear me? Yep, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, okay, check, I, just check. Want make, I just want to make sure you're yep, I'm, I'm talking. Good. Okay, cool. Uh, I have you as frozen right now. Oh, here we go. You're good. You're moving a little bit. Go. All right. Back on. Back on. Voice is good. Yeah, everything's great. All right. All right. So what I want to do now is I want to do top three Christopher Nolan movies. Um, do you feel prepared enough for that, Zach? I mean, that's a, that's a tough thing. I do. This is probably the hardest question. Yeah. You could ask me. Um, uh, I was thinking. If you would ask me tomorrow, I'd get different answers probably. But yeah. There's no doubt about that. Uh, what I want to do, let's go three, two, one. Uh, if we have matching answers, we'll say that. Um, you know, or if one is more higher ranked than the other, we, we can, we can say that be like, oh, if you say, you know, you got, uh, insomnia at three and I'm like, well, dude, I have that at two, then, um, we'll just talk about it. I'll let you know mine's at my two. Um, and I, I may have buried the lead. We've, we've already talked about this a little bit, um, about like what I love, but we're going to get there. Zach, why don't you start with your, your number three and why, what do you got? Yeah. Um, so I ended up having to basically do a bracket for this. Uh, oh, I love you know, it. There's a few Nolan movies that I was able to kind of cross off. I was like, they're good, but not not top ones. I ended up with about six that I had to narrow down. So I went bracket. Yeah. Um, and it ended up being The Dark Knight versus Batman Begins. Yeah. And I gave my number three to Batman Begins. Okay. Um, which was a, it's a big change. Now, you know, we talked about this before that there's a difference between favorite and best. Yep. Um, I and think are, The Dark Knight is one of the best are, are, films are, ever made. Are, are you doing um, more of a mixture here, or are you kind of just saying favorites? I'm just doing favorite. I'm doing favorite right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I, I just wa- I watched both these movies within the last two weeks, or maybe just within the last week. Um, and Batman Begins had such a, a grit and an ambiance and um, the way that Nolan is able to intercut the origin story within the actual – plot of the movie i think it just skips over so like the biggest kind of drag of origin movies of just having to spend half the movie just watching your guy try to get his powers and do that um and it brings up these complex questions um i'm a huge scarecrow fan i'm also a huge killian murphy fan amazing um so that for me was uh just crushed i think um and we, we already talked about this but i think batman begins is the best batman movie yeah 
Uh, the Absolutely. best movie about Batman, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're going pure Batman, uh, I think I'm with you here. Uh, Batman Begins, it, it is one because I think I saw Dark Knight before I saw Batman Begins. I did too, actually. Um, yep. Yeah. And it was just. It, it's so great and it's so uh, so full and rich. You got a, a great Liam Neeson, um, and, and you have a great twist. You have a beautiful world building um, that I think only gets better um, when you go to the Dark Knight. But really, just sets the tone for this series because at, at this point too in history, we the last Batman movie was Batman versus Robin. Which, uh, you know, we don't talk about that one anymore. Unless My we wanna... favorite as a kid, you know, uh, yeah. I watched the most. Of, you know, you had your, your Val Everybody Schiller, freeze. Had my George Clooney. <laughs> okay, just freeze. for Mr. Freeze alone, that should be the best one. I mean, I, the ice puns in that are out yeah. of control, and I never get Everybody tired of it. Everybody chill. But, yeah, I mean, Batman begins. What killed the dinosaurs? The Ice Age. The Ice Age. <laughs> uh, but this total, I mean, what, what movies were coming out before this, like, daredevil and catwoman yeah, and right. superheroes were dead as a genre before yeah. batman begins came out yeah and it was a totally different take because it was less fantastical and more um yeah it was kind of rooted in reality and and you could kind of believe what was happening here um and yeah dude it's just it's a really great movie and yeah it, it gave us so many other great great nolan so i commend this pick um my, yeah. my number, my number me tomorrow might be different but Hey, well, Today's it's fine. Batman begins. This is recorded. This is good. This and is safe forever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but so my number three is is the Dark Knight and, and the Dark Knight. Uh, you know, which is great. We we can talk about that. But yeah, for me, man, this is one of the most rewatchable movies of all time. Um, mm -hmm. Just and it's anytime it's on, you can just, you can just ride with it. Like, because for me, like when when I made my top three, I, I kind of did a mixture of ones that I like really appreciate, but also I just oh, I'm sold on. Like I, it just it, it eat me up, and the Dark Knight just does that, man. Like, like scene the scenes just move so well together. So many memorable lines. You do have the greatest to me the greatest villain in movie history. Sorry, Darth Vader, um, and dude, it, it was just splendid across the board. And I just remember being a kid seeing it too. Like I got to see it as a kid in theaters mm -hmm. and it's I was in junior high when I saw that. Yeah, man. It's, it scared the crap out of me, but it also like was just like, Whoa, this is dope. And just the, from the opening scene, like we've talked about the dark Knight a lot on the DBN, but just that opening scene just sets the tone as a movie of like, this is the kind of movie we're in. It is this guy's movie who is methodically knows what his next step is, but also has no idea what his next step is. And, and to see each henchman, one, explode out of that window, which if you're a Dark Knight fan, you know which window it is. You know right the when it pulls up. You, you, could, you Hey, it's yep. that one right there. It's that you one. Okay. This one. <laughs> and then boom. And then you just see, like, you know, I, I got I to kill the last guy. And then boom, boom, boom. And then finally, you know, I, I'd kill the bus driver. What bus driver? And then boom. Like... It, it, as a movie, you know, that's what you want in an opening scene is, is what are we in for for the rest of this ride? And we're in for this guy right here, this agent of chaos, the Joker. And we just get more and more of him when he opens his mouth and he talks to these tough mobsters. And, he, you know, he doesn't want to blow things out of proportions, right? And <laughs> to me, man, Dude. And, and he just – the fact that, like, he, the Joker actually takes Christian Bale and Batman out of his own movie – is such a joker thing to do and that's what happened in this screenplay yes. and and he he, he literally took him out of this movie and, and it became joker's movie and that's what everyone remembers it by is because of the joker um and and heath ledger and i just love too that to me heath ledger being the joker is my last point it really set the tone for superhero casting because if you told me the pretty boy from a knight's tale and 10 things i hate about you was going to play the most menacing villain there is i would have been like that's so silly and he blew it out of the water and of course another one is anne hathaway later on which i'm like princess diaries is catwoman Pfft, that's silly boom no <laughs> she's absolutely phenomenal uh but that, that, to me that's why the dark knight is it's my number three uh but mainly because these other two just kind of knock it yeah. out but the dark it's knight, so hard to choose with Nolan. but you i think you mentioned darth vader there um and you say that, that the Joker is, is the best villain in film. I'm going to go a step farther and say he's the best antagonist in all of literature. Yeah. I don't think there's ever been another antagonist that is able 
to attack the pressure points of a hero and push them to their absolute brink yeah. the way that the Joker does. He is the most perfectly designed antagonist for Batman that there's ever been. And we've seen iterations of the Joker countless times, but the way that David Goyer and Chris Nolan wrote him and the way that Heath Ledger brought him to life yeah. is out of this world. Like, yeah. it you never get tired of watching him do his thing. You know, you, you know he's not a schemer. He's not a schemer like the rest of the villains. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's a he's a dog chasing cars, and you know he he wouldn't know what to do with one if he got his hands on it, right? Like even that line, like he, they captured the Joker, they did it, and and like to me, it, it's so funny because uh, Zach Galifianakis is a great Joker in um, Lego Batman movie. Mark Hamill, of course, in the Arkham games is phenomenal, iconic. Um, uh, but like Heath Ledger set a different tone for the Joker. And the fact that Joaquin Phoenix came and did his own iteration, uh, a mentally unstable, like a mental health 2019 Joker was also phenomenal because it's his own thing. And like you said, this is the best antagonist and it is why he will continue to be made and there will be different iterations of him. And you know what? Jared Leto one is absolutely ridiculous, but you know, it was a hot topic version that the world tried <laughs> and, and you know, we tried it. The first and... person to try to follow Pete Ledger was going to fail. Didn't yeah. matter who you were. Yeah. Wasn't going to work. So it, I'm it sorry you had to take that bullet, Jared Leto, but you know, not your fault. Yeah. I mean, you, you really cannot go wrong with the dark Knight. I would have been, I didn't pick it. And I would have been furious if you didn't pick it. And it wasn't somewhere yeah. on this list. Cause this has to be in the conversation yeah. of the best Nolan movies. It has to, um, uh, why don't you go with your number two? Yeah. So, um, the next bracket I had, um, and I really want to give an honorable mention to this one. Um, you know, following up something like inception, the dark Knight rises interstellar for Nolan to kind of pivot and do something, uh, a little bit smaller, um, which is, hilarious to say for the scale of that movie but it is a little smaller for nolan but i think this is by far his most emotional film you know i think the one criticism that people throw at nolan which i don't 100 percent agree with but that they feel cold and there's not a lot of emotion in the movies dunkirk is so full of emotion yeah you know the scene where the soldiers on the beach first see the ships coming in you know i teared up the last time i watched it you know it really yeah. took my third viewing of it for me to really really appreciate it for what it was so if you're not a big dunkirk fan go rewatch it um but on, i want to give an honorable mention to dunkirk before i get to my number two which is the prestige ah, the nice. prestige is such an underrated gem every magician um, it is has literally is I, I i i <laughs> michael k um there really is something just Michael Caine. Michael. Every manager took my out three parts. Your turn. The first um, part is your you turn. Know, the point is in that. <laughs> I said it was like going home. <laughs> <laughs> um, that movie is just infinitely rewatchable to me for some reason. I know a lot, not a lot of other people feel that, that way, but it really is. I, I feel like it's Nolan kind of making a movie about what it's like to tell a story hmm. and how you bring people into it and how you fool them and how you make them think one thing only to surprise them with something else. Um, also, I mean, that um, is a huge inspiration for me on the um, the piece of work that I'm currently creating, um, yeah. especially David Bowie as Nikola Tesla is one of my Oof. favorite casting choices of Absolutely. all time. Absolutely. Um, I think Ethan Hawke is actually supposed to take, be Tesla in this upcoming film, which good casting i love it but david bowie and tesla for me kind of equate in this vision of sort of these like almost immortal beings that it, yeah. it seems almost impossible that they could die um yeah. so really that entire film start to finish okay. uh i just it's just it's just prime nolan i think it was maybe nolan's first time insomnia had a pretty good cast but where he had a very big ensemble here with scar joe hugh jackman michael kane uh, christian bale a lot of big names and he juggled them all really well um but it is a story i remember for me when i saw the prestige um dude i it was the first movie and maybe the only movie since then to where i said i shouted when the twist came I, I literally was like, what? I, I, I remember I dropped whatever I was holding because I, I could not believe that they got me. And it was a movie about a magic trick, mm -hmm. uh, about magic tricks, and yet they got me. They, you know, you look knew as it was coming. Close you knew something you was coming. And it was always right there in the foreground, right in front of you the whole way through. And, um, yeah, just seeing people, like, competition 
uh, amongst two people and the where that drives people and what they will sacrifice for that, whether it's relationships, whether it is their own like sanity, their own humanity, their own yeah. humanity, their morals. They'll give it all up for competition, which give I their think, life for this, dude, they will cut off limbs for this. Um, and they, they literally take it there and it's a really phenomenal movie. Honestly, probably the one that I will now watch, uh, from talking about it. Cause <laughs> I, I think, I think in a, it's also one of those enough time has passed where I can still be a little shocked by it, but I will is, never is forget the voodoo? initial. Can I, can I grab that tonight if I want? I believe it is on my voodoo. I think I have the hard disc okay. too. I might, I might pop that in. Um, that's actually, I think that's might be the one Nolan movie I don't own, um, that I, that I really need to. Um, yeah. But I like it because, like you said, it's been so long since I've watched it that every time I come back, it's so fresh and it hits me yeah. so well that, um, yeah, just an incredible piece of film. Yep. Re- really All good. Right, number two. Honorable second choice. Uh, so my number two, uh, number one and two, man, I-, I think these are the two that can swap at any moment. But they're the, the two most recent that I've watched, too. Um, but I don't think there's recency bias. I've always felt this way. My number two um, is – it's Inception, man. Like it, it really is. And, yep, and it, that was it's my number one. That's your number one. All right. Sorry to bury yep. the lead here, but uh, yeah, man, it, it's Inception because to me, watching it again, man, it is just so crazy of an idea, and it is so landed. Like it is so together, um, and all of it makes sense. And you know what? There, there probably is a little bit too much talking and explaining things, but you know what? You have to when it's something that complex. And another great ensemble cast, uh, and every single person hits their mark. Um, every set piece, every uh, you know, you, you, the, there are images from that movie that you'll never forget. And I think Nolan does a great job of that. Interstellar is another example of you remember that world with the giant wave, you remember that ice planet, but you also remember the the anti gravity twisting of the hotel. Um, Nolan is just so ambitious, and I think that's what you're seeing here in Tenet, even in the previews and whatnot, that he is about to push it even further, and we're going to have set pieces to remember by. A lot of critics are already saying that, too, um, is that while it's all super ambitious, it's it's memorable as hell. And um, I, I think with the last time I watched, I really zeroed in on Cobb and just, like, the, the mental turmoil that was in. Like, we don't realize we're in his head. Like, like we're like, I don't think I ever really connected that that we're in his head. And this is a bad trauma from a marriage that he did himself and he still has to live with every day and he still has to figure out kids. And, um, I heard these guys, um, on this podcast talk that one thing that you can tell really means a lot to Christopher Nolan is home. Um, you, you see a lot of that throughout his whole thing. It's all about the home. It's all about the family. Um, and what you do that. And this, this is a story about a man trying to get back to his family, except it's about planting ideas through dreams. What a freaking idea. Um, so it's inception, man. And you could, you could could throw on time at any point and I will vibe to time. I can't skip mm, it. mm, Come on. mm. Oh. Uh, I uh, um I was listening to Tarantino talk about Nolan the other day, um and he says uh he makes this comparison to to Stanley Kubrick and how Stanley Kubrick can make these insanely high concept you know pictures and then take the studio along with him and yeah, that's really wow. what Nolan does so well and I think it's it's really at its peak in Inception he takes this incredibly high concept of idea and he he starts off the film with it you the, your first fifteen minutes you're a dream within a dream already yeah. because he knows he's going to have to take you even deeper. You couldn't just start off with, you know, planting an idea in a dream. Yeah. You have to go that deep that early because it only gets deeper and deeper and deeper. I'd like to give another shout out to Killian Murphy. If no. he's in the movie, I'm going to love it. Yeah. Um, another Nolan but, regular, no, which he has quite a few. I remember the, mm-hmm. yeah. and I never get tired of it. No, that yeah. is actually, I think my single greatest. Well, I don't want to jump ahead. I think I have two of my favorite cinema experiences ever. They're both Christopher Nolan movies. Um, I distinctly remember sitting in the front row, you know, the front middle row of the, of the theater watching this film. And somewhere down the line, you know, everyone's feet are up on the bars on that, on that front row, right? Yeah. Um, and so somewhere down the line, I felt somebody get a, their phone vibrated. And the vibration goes down the bars and I feel it. And I got sucked out of the movie. Like for the whole first hour and 45 minutes, I had completely lost the sense of my body or that I was in a theater at all. I was so completely immersed in the movie that that sensation of coming back into the theater, I was like, what is going on? This is unbelievable. Um, I think I went back the very next day and saw it again just because I was just so 
I mean, the, the idea itself is so intoxicating, um, you know, dreams in themselves. And I think this is another similar to the prestige Nolan kind of talking about storytelling without necessarily talking about storytelling. Right. I think you look at all the different characters in that film, you know, yeah. you have Cobb, who's like the director, you have Saito, yeah. who's the producer, you have Ariadne, who's the, um, the set designer, yeah. Eames uh, being the actor. Um, there's, I think it's a common theme throughout. Uh, Foster is the audience. Movies, Foster but, is the audience. He's you know, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Rubber. Yeah. Yeah. But really the, the, the more you go down that rabbit hole, the more intense the film gets. And by the time you get to the end and you're watching these four different timelines going on and then they wake up on the plane and you're like, how did he pull this off without, without losing me? Like you're, you're just so engrossed the entire time. And I think it's one of those, so many of these movies, nobody but Christopher Nolan could have made them. And it's my number one because I it's I am so glad that Christopher Nolan was born to make this movie. Absolutely. Um, so that that's why it goes to my number one. Yeah, it's uh, there's also the funny thing where um, I saw it was like a meme of like directors who have casted better looking versions of themselves and then like <laughs> made them look. And, and Leo, his hair and all, looks like Christopher Nolan in that movie. A hundred percent. That's a great you know, point. Adam Driver in Marriage Story looks just like Noah Baumbach, <laughs> except a better looking. Like it, it was a cool meme. Uh, maybe we'll throw it up. But uh, yeah, man, it's a uh, it's a phenomenal piece. Like it's. And it, it holds up to, um, yeah, I, I just, and, you know, it's, it's really, um, all I the miss, senses are hit. Uh, the, I miss the Wally Pfister cinematography days. I think dark Knight rises was his last one, but inception was kind of the last independent one that, um, Nolan and Wally Pfister worked on together after that. I think Pfister went off and made transcendence with Johnny Depp. Um, and I'm, I, I really enjoy Hoyt Van Hoytma's work. Um, seeing it um, in Interstellar, Dunkirk, and I mean the cinematography and tenage from the trailers looks great, yeah. but there's something so iconic about that era of Nolan movies when he's working with Wally Pfister and Inception just has that look, that vibe, the lines, the music. It's, and then I mean that final shot, you know, times just going, they're getting off the plane, and he spins the top, and it mm. cuts. Yeah. Like, could there? Guess what? It doesn't matter whether he's awake or not. He's back with his kids. Yeah. That's all yeah. that matters. Yeah. He's overcome his trauma and he can he can enjoy life with his children. Whether they're real or not, who cares? Yeah. Um and it's it's just a it's a virtuoso at work. Now I had actually when I was re when I was watching it, um I was watching it, dude. I actually think and I I don't know that I you know, it's one of those things where it's so pure, it's a one off thing, but if someone told me that they were doing a prequel to Inception or that they were gonna turn it into a series of, you know, maybe these uh, people who go and incept other people and, and, and all these different, like, I'd be open to it. And I, it is absolutely yeah. something. It is a world that I'm like, ah, oh, I want to live there again. And I know it's so precious that it's like, this is this one perfect story, but there is so much to that world that could be discovered. And that's obviously the part of storytelling is you leave it up for them. You leave it up for us to imagine that on ourselves. Mm -hmm. But, um, there's so Have much. Have you seen better, the prequel? Man. There is a prequel. I there's a prequel to Inception. Um, on the DVD extras, there is a animated um, version of the lead up to the Cobalt job. Oh, interesting. I haven't seen it in probably 10 years, but it gives you a little taste of, of the lead up to the movie. It's funny because there are a few lines, too, in that movie that I wonder if the studio inputted where, um, where you know, Cobb looks at Michael Caine and he's like, I need someone who is as good as I was. You know, and it's like, whoa, there's a past here. There they mm. they they've ran into and even they talk about like like how does Joseph Gordon Levitt's character know all that stuff? It's because they failed, and I kind of want to see that. I want to see them realize, oh shoot, you can feel. When Eames pain. talked about his failed Inception mission, like yes. I would love to see the Eames job where they try to incept somebody and it doesn't work. Yes, like there's yeah that's or yeah. there's obviously this this exp this shared experience of yeah. of dream heisting that um is it's just such an amazing concept. Like you said, I. I, you keep going back to that same movie over and over because that I think we're just so intoxicated by the idea of dreams and yeah. you know given the ability to have this infinite playground for ourselves where you can create anything and do anything um, as just effortlessly is is like it's as a human what more could you want yeah. um, but at the same time it's a catch twenty two you know you can lose yourself in it absolutely so, um, absolutely uh, great Nolan. great damn stuff. you Nolan <laughs> damn you Nolan but so my number one uh, and I I know this will change but um, it's Dunkirk and you you mentioned Dunkirk um, to me dude 
I think right now it's my favorite just because it was absolutely not Nolan. Uh, but it was it was him because it was a movie mm-hmm. about going home. It was a movie about getting there and very little dialogue, you know, less than 100 minutes. Um, clear, like, intensity, clear, great shots that I will never forget. Uh, the plane landing at the very end after oh, all the dog the cheer fights. that goes up after he shoot after he saves the people oh my oh god oh my gosh the the shame that harry styles feels when like people are running up there's a, there's a moment at the end where harry styles just feels clearly defeated and people are running up and he hides his face and they slam a newspaper the up to the window and they they grab the newspaper and he starts reading winston churchill's <laughs> thing about how there is victory in survival and there is like just so much happening you got kenneth brana given not many lines but he gives the lines and he delivers them what could be really cheesy to me they hit really well of talking about you know what is that he's like home like and it's just like it's really well and you just see these guys fighting for their lives um the opening scene the fa- the the papers falling from the sky they grab it and you immediately know what's going that, on. That intercut is so good. You just you know what's going on. The the music, the clock ticking. Uh, you, your boy Killian Murphy comes in and, and just really shake things up as this broken down soldier, and and just is like, I'm I'm not going back. And just shows us that 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 island like everyone wants off of it. And these guys will pick up a dead body or a bruised body to bring them in, um, and do all this stuff. And then yeah. I, there's just so much to it that was uh, that just hit so well, and I remember when I first saw it in theaters, I was just like, "Wow!" Like I don't know, I would have guessed this was a Christopher Nolan movie because his movies are very talky. They will explain every little thing that is happening. The fact that he said, "I'm gonna make a war movie with very little dialogue, with very big set pieces, you know, little CGI," I blown away that he could pull that off and he can show i'm a most i'm a multifaceted director i can do superhero movies i can do big concept movies but i can also do war movies that are intimate and powerful yeah and just like gripping and so to me i think that's why dunkirk stands where it does because to me I, it he proved so much more than maybe he ever has to me in what he did in yeah dunkirk. He, he shut up the doubters with that one immensely yeah. there was uh there was so many moments, especially in the third act of that, that, you know, not even I can't even imagine watching that movie if you're British, um, yeah. even having, you know, very little, you know, only a very cursory understanding of what the situation in Dunkirk was going into this movie. Um, that scene where all the civilian boats kind of appear on the horizon oh my and gosh. all the soldiers start cheering. You're just I, I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it. It's it's unbelievable. And then, like yeah. you said, they, when they finally get home. And the, the guy won't even really look at the soldiers and say, you know, welcome back, boys. Good job, good job. And and your main character, it's like, we didn't do anything. Yeah. You know, all we did was survive. That's enough. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and to just and just see everybody want to just, just jump in for this one big main event in human history. And, and there was a lot of, I mean, like pandemic parallels for me of like everyone kind of doing their own part. And then a lot of people feeling like they're isolated and they're stuck and they just, you know, they're, they're lost due to these just circumstances that are out of their control and they, all they can do is hope and fight. And, um, at the end they, they get out of it and they get to celebrate and they get to be proud because guess what? Survival is victory. And that is a really interesting message for Christopher Nolan to bring across. Um, and the way that he did the fact that he turned a guy from one direction into a very stolid, uh, movie star, solid actor, solid actor and then you know what we probably got watermelon sugar because of that movie if we're being honest if we're, if we're being <laughs> that's honest. actually the beach they filmed it on if you didn't know <laughs> it, it, it was all all those the women were, were in in the movie as well yeah <laughs> uh no but man it, no. it's just it, to me it's just the cleanest of, of all of it because um well i think nolan is so sharp with all this stuff nothing was as concise as um as dunkirk for me yeah and really there's a i mean all the way through that movie i think it's so interesting to see you know his signature 
non-linear storytelling the way he does that yeah. you know it's nolan yeah. there's no way that there's not going to be some element of of time in this time, yeah. um and really the more it took me a couple watches to really notice you know oh, there's the planes flying over the ship oh yeah. and there's killian murphy on the boat before he gets sunk you know there's just this um you, you really couldn't tell it if you told it chronologically it would lose so much of that oomph that it has nolan yeah. is so amazing at you know, one of his greatest skills is the way he can cross cut scenes and yeah. build tension throughout the whole thing. And you hear it in the score. I mean, Hans Zimmer's score, that song Supermarine is unbelievable. I mean, Dude, the way yeah. he has that technique, um, I totally forget the name of it, some Italian concerto term, but it, it's really just that infinite building sound where it just sounds yeah. like the tone is constantly going up, even though it's really staying still, um, which, I mean, that that's the movie right there. It just continually ratchets up the tension the entire time. And yeah. Um, yeah, it shows that, like you said, he's not just not just the blockbuster guy. He he's a real master of his craft. Yep, and it got him a nomination for best picture. So I think, and I think, oh, yeah, you know, so. it's about it's about damn time. Yeah, it um, is. Uh, a few honorable mentions uh, to me in my number four spot because um, I, I did do kind of a, I did his full filmography. I got Memento right in there because that Ooh, is another on. one very intimate, very oh gosh for like a young. That was his first like big feature after Following, yeah. which I haven't seen Following. Um, I got Memento in there, and then uh, you know we we didn't really talk too much about Interstellar, but Interstellar is it was really difficult for me to leave Interstellar off this list. Yeah, um, and I, I know in your household, is... yeah, you guys love your Interstellar. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> David's uh, that's David's go to movie. Yeah. Um, Interstellar, you feel like is Nolan at his most. Nolan at his um, most and I mentioned, <laughs> that, I, I his mentioned most. earlier that there's a uh, you know there's two when I think about my best movie going experiences ever there's two of them there's a that that feeling of of being pulled out of the dream watching Interstellar um, but I will never forget as long as I live sitting in IMAX and hearing like what are you doing docking and then the music goes mm-hmm. and I, I there's nothing that quite compares to the scale and the stakes of the emotion in that movie, I mean, not only is the entire human race at stake, but this incredibly beautiful relationship between a father and a daughter getting is home. also at stake. Yeah. Um, getting home. That's exactly right. That, yeah, there, I mean, I, it's hard for me to make it through Interstellar without falling asleep um, yep. just because it's so long. And I almost, I, you have to watch it at night. Um, but when I do get that full experience, um, it is really such an emotional journey that uh, yeah. it was it was really difficult it, for me to not put it on the list it was in the same bracket as inception and when it came down to it i had to give it to inception but um yeah. you know maybe if it had been in the 16th seed it might have been able to pull an upset uh, yeah it absolutely could in that 16th seed uh insomnia is is one um interesting uh but i'd say a misstep uh you know a rare misstep from nolan but you'd still not it's not like it won't waste your time i would say that if no. you're curious about insomnia it's not going to waste your time great robin um, williams performance yeah yeah you know a really interesting kind of gritty dark you know kind of type movie but uh i would say overall forgettable overall forgettable probably at the bottom of my list but uh yeah. and memento is one that i'm like that was another one that blew me away and his first kind of display of like yo I, i'm gonna mess with all of you like i'm gonna i'm gonna go black and white here and i'm gonna like i'm gonna let me tell the story backwards and it's gonna end up being told forwards and it's just like what but you're gonna still anyway. understand it when we get to the end yeah you're at the end you're gonna go whoa like you're gonna you're gonna need like it, ibuprofen because it's all mm-hmm. it has you all messed up uh well we have nolan figured out it sounds like uh as some christopher nolan fans um gosh i tell you what it's been a big week for Pattinson, big week for Nolan. You know, yeah. I'm I'm very excited to see that combination together. I'll tell you that. Yeah. It uh gosh, and you got John David Washington you know, there too. You yeah. know, last time we were on the podcast, we were talking about John David Washington. Black we Klansman. did we, we we were we were talking about Black Clans. Great episode. So. Definitely check out Zach's uh Zach's stuff. So Zach, you are uh you're currently fun employed. How's that going, man? Unemployed. That's that's great. Um, yeah, it's actually really <laughs> enjoyable. Um, you know, I had a had a very today. This week was really my first week um, working for myself. I'm pretty productive. Signed a couple yeah. of clients. Got some money coming in, so it's not too stressful. You know, before we get too far, Dylan, I do need to make an addendum to something I said on my last feature on, <laughs> um, yeah, on the DBN. And you've I, been, I, you've I, been waiting I'm, a, I'm a few years a to do this. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. The- um, we were doing our, our Desert Island uh, picks, and I, you know, I had to throw Lord of the Rings on there. I'm actually I just started reading the the books this week, 
um, and you know, I, I put the Fellowship of the Ring on there, and I, I went out and I said, you know, I, I think people kind of overrate um, Return of the King. Ooh. So, a <laughs> uh, couple months uh, early on in quarantine, I did a uh, I did a full rewatch, all extended editions, and I take back everything I said about Return of the King. <laughs> I literally the whole second half. I'm literally just just crying. Just the emotional journey. Of, I'm just distraught. Whether it's Aragorn rushing for the gates, whether it's Sam picking up Frodo, whether it's people bowing to the hobbits, whether it's the hobbits saying goodbye to Frodo. The whole last hour and a half, I'm just an emotional wreck, like I haven't been. I don't think in any other movie ever. So I'd like to apologize to everybody involved in the making of that film and Peter Jackson and say that I. I, I will firmly put Return of the King as one of my all-time favorite movies. So you know what? appreciate uh, the opportunity to come clean. <laughs> that was the point of all of this is for you to just come out here. We, we, everyone's I really been needed to come it. back and say that. <laughs> Peter Jackson is a subscriber to the DBN, so he was upset, okay. and he's probably I, not going to listen to this, I, but we, we'll get him to. Sorry, PJ. <laughs> uh, well, Zach, before we let you go, um, you got anything you, you got to plug? Anywhere we can read your writing? Is that coming soon? Uh, anything like that? It's coming soon. Nothing yet, but uh, I'm going to have to come back on when I'm ready to promote. I got a good – about 120 pages done over the last two months that I'm actually really proud of. So we're, we're honing in on – the finish line is in sight. I'm thinking within the next six months we'll, we'll be there. It's been, a, it's been a long, long journey, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, I know everybody's really anxiously waiting for it. But oh, anyway, yeah. if, you like, if you like Christopher Nolan, if you like The Prestige, if you like Stranger Things, you might like this. So Ooh, stay tuned. Wow. All right. Sounds like a delicious smoothie there. Um, to be had. So, but you've also been doing some a deep dive in Westworld. You've been into that. You recommend yeah, so, that? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I just started. Um, so I, I watched Westworld season one when it came out. Um, which is a it's made by Jonathan Nolan, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's obviously um, well, you know, if you haven't watched it, I won't get too much into it. But I'm I'm about halfway through season two. I'm loving it. I can't wait to get into season three. I love the way that they they blend and they mash these different genres of sci-fi and western. Um, and it's a genre show, but it really brings up these seriously deep questions about, you know, what does it mean to be a human being you know, and, and all these things about consciousness and whatnot that I, I love anything that can do that. They can entertain me and, and be fun, but also kind of pull up bigger questions and really make you think. So that's, that's a Nolan specialty. I don't know what that dad showed them when he was a kid, but, or when those two were kids, but my gosh, did he do a fine job raising those boys? Yeah. Uh, well, that's good to hear. And you were also a fan of Hamilton. Right, we we can say. I was that. a fan of Hampton. It's just, I, so my dad's an American history teacher. I love American history. This was something I thought that I'd be interested in, but I didn't want to listen to the soundtrack unless I could get the full experience. So, really glad that Disney Plus was able to bring that to everybody. And I, yeah. I went in with really high expectations, and they were completely met. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed that. Yeah, I've yet to give my thoughts on Hamilton on the DBN, but I think that's coming soon. So. uh but you know, we're maybe, all we'll, maybe we'll have you contribute a sound bite of your thought or two. Uh, I, I'd love to throw in a little, a little quip on a little that. Because I know you love that king. I know you love the king. <laughs> that King George, I mean, he stole the show every time he came out, man. <laughs> he did. He did. So, hey, you'll so, be back. Hey, you like will be before. Zach, Zach Dunn will be back. Zach, thank you so much for coming on, dude. You are the man. Uh, I miss you already, man. Just Thanks so much, this. Dylan. It's, it's always a pleasure, man. I'm, anytime. Hopefully, hopefully I get to see you soon. All right, maybe soon. All right, later, Zach. Well, folks, that's it. Uh, thank you to Zach Dunn for hopping in. Uh, talking a lot of Batman. So sorry if that was just so obnoxious. Uh, but hey, it's what we do. This is the DBM. We we talk about uh, things that Dylan loves, and the Batman is just it's almost at the top of the list. Um, again, thanks so much for listening. Of course, subscribe. You know, tell your friends. Whatever. Who cares? We're just having fun out here. Uh, We love you. Stay safe, everybody. And, um, yeah, see you next time. Peace.